Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Uh, today, we're going to hear the final group of presentations relating to those who died in the fire. Yes, Mr. Millett. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Good morning to you. Good morning, members of the panel. I would now invite Mr. Danny Friedman, QC, please, to come back to the podium to make the presentation on behalf of the family of Mohammed Al Hajali from flat 112 on floor 14 of Grenfell Tower. As before, may I repeat the trigger warning that I've given in the past that what Mr. Friedman may show us or tell us during the course of his presentation may be distressing to some in the room or watching on the live stream, and therefore they should absent themselves from here or, from the, or look away from the live stream, as the case may be. Subject to that, Mr. Friedman, thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Al Hajali was born in Damascus, Syria on the 27th of November 1993. He grew up in Dara, a city in the south of Syria. He was 23 years old at the time of his death. Mohammed was the second eldest of five children born to Nidal and Haim Al Hajali. His two brothers are Omar and Hashim, and his sisters Arkenda and Sham. Mohammed traveled to the United Kingdom with his brother Omar in 2014. Their other brother Hashim would arrive approximately six months later. Mohammed remained very close to his family in Syria, speaking to them daily. Having been originally housed in Leeds, Mohammed and Omar al Hajali and their childhood friend Mahmoud al Karad moved into flat 112 of Grenfell Tower in September 2016. At the time of his death, Mohammed was studying for a degree in civil engineering, working part-time to fund his studies, and engaged to be married to Amal al Hufefi. Mohammed's father and mother appeared in the commemoration hearings on the 29th of May 2018 with their children, together with Mahmoud, his friend, and Amal, his fiancée. Muhammad's father, his brother Hashem, and Mahmoud addressed the chair, and three films were played, all of which described their loved one and the impact of his loss. The commemorative portraits highlighted that as, as a son, brother, fiance, and friend, Muhammad al Hajali was an unusually charismatic person, much loved and valued for his selflessness, compassion, and strength of personality. His brother Omar, told you that Muhammad wasn't just his brother, but his best friend, someone who could, he, he could tell and share everything with. You heard how he was popular and knew everyone at his university. He loved to meet new people and was a natural leader amongst his peers. Omar recalled that when Muhammad was young, he would wear his father's suits, which were of course far too big for him. He did this because he wanted to emulate his father and was wise beyond his years. His mother, Hayam, echoed this sentiment, describing him as distinguished and very responsible for his age. His sister, Sham, spoke about how Muhammad had inspired her to be the best that she could be as an individual and in her community. His fiancée, Amal, said he made her learn to love herself and made her feel like she could accomplish whatever she wanted in life. She said that to this day, she thinks of him whenever she has moments of self-doubt, knowing that if he were here, he would believe in her and give her the encouragement she needs. His friend, Mahmoud al Karad, who lived in flat 112 with Muhammad, and you heard from in module four, described Muhammad's good nature and how he was dedicated to his family. These were three young men in that flat in Grenfell Tower with really bright futures ahead of them. So you will recall being told of Muhammad's smile, his unrivaled joy for life and his dreams for the future, including his dream that one day he would be able to bring his whole family together in one place where they could settle and live their best life. This was a young man who was well-loved and loving. All who knew him agreed that he was one of a kind and they commend him to the world 
as you will never find another like him. On the night of the fire, Muhammad and Omar met up at their flat at around 7 to 8 p.m. and went to a friend's home for dinner to break the fast. As he told the panel in his Module 4 evidence, Mahmoud al Karad was not at home that night. He had started a work shift early in the morning on the 13th and would work through the day and onto the night shifts into the early hours of the 14th before returning to the fire. The two brothers came home to Grenfell Tower after their iftar meal. CCTV footage shows Mohammed in the lift lobby of Grenfell Tower at seven minutes past midnight, waiting to go up into the building just under 45 minutes before the start of the fire. Between 0120 and 0130, the rate of vertical fire spread up the northeast corner of the building accelerated considerably. At 01230, intermittent flame extended past the windows of floor 13 below. By 01236, the fire had reached the top of floor 15 above. At approximately 0125, the Mangoba family in flat 116 on floor 14 evacuated when flames destroyed their kitchen window, forcing them to flee in their nightclothes from the fire and the thick black smoke now in their home. They exited the building at 01.29.45. As the phase one report found at volume four, paragraph 24.31, the front door of flat 116 remained open when the occupants fled due to a non-functioning self-closing device. When Mrs. Magoba fled from flat 116, she saw smoke in the lobby but it was, like, it was light, like a cloud, and not thick black smoke, like in their flat. Due to the open flat front door, the floor 14 communal lobby inevitably filled up with dense smoke within a period of minutes, creating a barrier to escape for the remaining occupants on floor 14. The panel is aware of how on multiple floors in Grenfell Tower, multiple doors did not automatically close, especially the number six flat doors. This is another inescapable fatal consequence of that situation on this floor. Omar al-Hajjali, Mohammed's brother, was still awake at 1 a.m. when he heard sounds and then shouting outside. Mohammed came to tell him that he could smell smoke. When Omar looked out of a living room window which faced east, he saw flames to the left and about, at about the level of floor four or five, the brothers decided to leave. But when they opened their flat front door, they found the communal area was full of smoke and in complete darkness. Omar could only see his hand a little bit. He could not see the lifts. Based on the timing of the exit of the occupants of flat 116 and their descriptions of the conditions on the lobby at the time that they left, the phase one report found at volume two paragraph 11.96, that this occurred at around 0130, with the brothers looking outside on their lobby. They closed the front door and began to shout for help from a window until a firefighter on the ground shouted back, telling them firmly to stay where they were. Numerous calls were made to the control room by residents of floor 14 between 0125 and 0148 to report smoke penetrating first the floor and then their actual flats. None of these residents were advised to evacuate. As you will hear further in the next presentations today, there were calls from Dennis Murphy in flat 111 at 012516 and 0140. In the first call, the smoke was in the lobby. By the second call, his flat was full of smoke. Zainab Dean, in flat 115, made 999 calls at 012905 and 013818. She repeated that she was alone in the flat with her baby. Rosemary Oriawale from flat 113 made calls at 013758 and 014823. She relayed that she and her partner, Olawasan or Olo Talabi, had a baby with them. 
Rosemary described the lobby on floor 14 as black and reported thick black smoke coming through the letterbox. In both calls, she was told that the fire was on a much lower floor. Between these two calls, Miss Oyewale and Mr. Talabi attempted to escape their flat with their young daughter, but they turned back due to the conditions in the floor 14 lobby, which they found to be pitch black and like a steam room. At around 0151, a first crew of four firefighters, comprising firefighters Cornelius and Murphy, with Saunders and Merrion as the backup crew, were briefed to rescue the residents now known to be Dennis Murphy from flat 111. These firefighters, as a team of four, ended up taking steps to congregate all the remaining eight residents of floor 14 into flat 113 and told them to wait for further assistance. Flat 113 now contained the residents of that flat, Rosemary Oriwale and Olo Talabi and their four-year-old daughter. From flat 111, Mr. Murphy. From flat 112, the two brothers, Omar and Mohammed Al-Hajali. And from flat 115, Zainab Dean and her two-year-old son, Jeremiah. Firefighters Cornelius and Murphy tried to radio the bridgehead to say that they felt unable to bring the residents down the stairs, but got no response. Firefighter Marion, alone out of the deployed firefighters, recalled that prior to going up into the stairwell, they had been advised to instruct the occupants to stay in their flat. According to Omar Al-Hajali's evidence, before being moved across to flat 113, Mohammed and Omar asked to be evacuated. They were told by the firefighter, who appears to have been Mr. Merrion, that it was unsafe, that there was no spare BA equipment, and that they would not be able to breathe. He then left to speak to the other firefighters. After some minutes, the brothers were moved to flat 113 by a different firefighter without further explanation. Once in flat 113, the brothers pointed out to the firefighters the extent of the fire from the windows on both sides of the flat, but the decision remained that they were not to leave, despite their wish to do so. As is tragically underscored by Professor Purser's phase two evidence, it was possible for residents to safely evacuate from floor 14, and indeed the very highest floors of the tower at this point in time, and at all points prior to the external fire reaching the exterior of flat 113 and then entering it much later in the night. May I turn next to what was recorded at the fire ground about the congregation of these eight residents in flat 113. And for this, I'm going to ask for the images of the various walls and formats where flat numbers and other details were written down. And may I just give a trigger warning, those are the images that are about to be shown. Uh, it will be of numbers and flats and how that was recorded. May I first then ask um, to see MET three zeros one three oh seven four. Panel, on returning down the tower, firefighter Cornelius found the second floor bridgehead to have moved and he did not know where. And after trying to pass the information on to various people, made a note on the second floor wall. And this is a photograph of that wall taken by firefighter, firefighter O'Byrne. And you see the writing on the wall in the bottom right hand corner. 113, eight people, 14 floor. And that is what firefighter Cornelius said that he scribbled down on that wall. May I ask to see the forward information board, which is at MET 001849. This is the portable information board that would be carried wherever the bridgehead was and would have been up on that second floor mezzanine. And can I draw attention to the right hand side as we look at it, outside of that square 
list of various flats and numbers, you see in brackets, 14th floor, 111, so 111, not 113, and then eight persons. We don't know for sure, but it looks like those details were written onto the board as a result of firefighter to Cornelius coming down, trying to make sure that his superiors registered the details. Um, we have the eight persons noted, but it looks like it's the wrong flat, right floor. Can we then go to MET three zeros, one five eight one nine? The bridgehead had moved up to the third floor. And this is a photograph, you can see the three, of what was written down on that wall. Watch manager to Silver's FSG wall contains various references to floor 14 flats. If you look at the list of floor numbers going from top down to bottom, you see at the level of 15, first perhaps erroneously, um, the numbers written there look like 111, 115, 113. Then you get a reference to flat 122, which is on the 15th floor. And you see various crosses and ticks there. And then at the level of 14, just below it, you see 111 seems to be ticked, 115, 112 ticked, and it says 113, three rescues in brackets. And then further along the line, 113 underlined and then oblique 14. Just further down on that image, if you, if you look just under and to the right of where you've had the list of floor numbers top to bottom, you go down to floor three. And then just over at the right, there's 113. And then it's somewhat indecipherable. But under that is FL 14th and then something indecipherable, and just over across to the right, bottom right-hand corner, in line with that. Again, it's indecipherable, but it does say 14th FL, 14th floor, and what we think says flat 111, um, which may have a bearing on what had been Richard written on that forward information board that I showed you before. The bridgehead moved, as you know, after about 3.08 to establish itself on the ground floor. And again, information was written on the wall just as you came into the tower, the beige wall. And that is, may I show you two images? First, MET 001815815. We'll show a zoom in on this in a moment, but just for now, on the left-hand side, Left-hand side, as you look at it, in the middle of the column, you can see 112, 14, and then 8P, midway down. So 11, sorry, 1112, 14, 8P. So, so we suggest right floor, right number of persons, wrong flat. And then lastly on the ground floor, it's going to be a zoom in of what is the middle column here. And it's MET, three zeros, 15642. Just looking at the top part of it, you can see 111 and 14th. And then you can see under it 115 and 14th, and then further down, four or five from the bottom, you see 113 14th, and there's a suggestion a BA crew sent by virtue of the tick. That might be the inference. And it seems right at the bottom of the tick is BA114. C 
CCTV footage shows that watch manager Williams, who was making these entries, made them respectively at 02.21, that's the first two at the top of this image, and then at 02.30.57, the bottom entries, including that 113 14th entry. That concludes, uh, and you can take it down, thank you. That concludes the review of the various rules and boards. And the crucial data of 1138P8 persons was not, uh, uh, it may be fair to say, as clearly written on the third floor and the ground floor as it was by firefighter Cornelius on that second floor mezzanine or indeed on the forward information board. At approximately 02.23, a crew comprising firefighters Cook and Flanagan happened to enter flat 113 as they returned from a higher floor. They saw the eight residents congregated in the flat. There is no evidence that they informed the bridgehead of this. After firefighter Cook and Flanagan left, the first desperate efforts were made by Olu Tulabi to climb with his daughter from the window by tying together sheets. This can be timed by reference to Rosemary Oliawala's call to the control room at 0231, in which a male can be heard in the background screaming, and Rosemary asks if it was safer to try and jump from the window. Firefighters appear to have witnessed this from the outside and shouted at the desperate resident to get back in. The next deployments of firefighters to floor 14, after the congregation of the residents in flat 113, were made either side of 0230. At this time, two different crews of two firefighters were deployed separately and without mutual knowledge or coordination of the parallel deployments. The first crew, comprising firefighters Herrera and Orchard, began to ascend the stairs after 0227. Neither member of the first crew recalled being briefed of the presence of eight residents in number in flat 113. Firefighter Orchard recalls the briefing to rescue six people, but firefighter Herrera states that the brief was to rescue, quote, a family, an adult male, a female, and a child. As the phase one report found at volume three, Paragraph 15.91, it is unlikely that watch manager De Silva would have given inconsistent briefings to two firefighters in the same crew, so one of these two accounts must be incorrect. The second crew, comprising crew manager McAlolan and firefighter Juggins, tallied out at 0231. This crew was briefed separately to the first crew, pursuant to a parallel FSG system at the ground floor lobby and not by an officer at the bridgehead. Those briefing were watch managers Williams and Watson. As the phase one report found at volume three, paragraph 15.92, the brief of the second crew was to rescue a female and child from the now empty flat 111. As the phase one report concluded, that was unfortunately doubly erroneous because one, the occupant of flat 111, Dennis Murphy, had been moved to flat 113, and two, the female and her son, Zainab Dean and Jeremiah Dean, were originally located in flat 115, not flat 111. Panel, as will be clear, both crews were incorrectly briefed regarding the location and number of residents. Importantly, they were unaware of the number, eight persons, and profile of the occupants in flat 113. The second crew, crew manager McAlonan and firefighter Juggins, reached floor 14 first. Once on the lobby, their evidence is that they went to flat 111. The door was open. They searched the flat, which was empty. C.M. McAlolan tried to make radio contact with the bridgehead to see if there were any more information in relation to Flat 111. He could not get through. The crew then decided to continue searching Floor 14. 
they moved to flat 1112, which they also found empty. Meanwhile, firefighters Orchard and Herrera, as the first crew, had also reached floor 14. They went straight to flat 113 and knocked on the door, shouting fire brigade. The events that follow remain the subject of an evidential dispute. However, the tragic result is clear. Four of the occupants, Aulu Talabi, Rosemary Oyawale, their daughter, and Omar Al-Hajjali, were guided down the stairs by the firefighters, while the other four occupants, Dennis Murphy, Mohammed Al-Hajjali, Zainab Dean, and Jeremiah Dean, were left behind. Of the four left behind, three would die in the flat, while Mohammed would fall to his death at the point in time when conditions in the flat were no longer survivable. As the Phase 1 report records at Volume 3, paragraph 15.96, it is not in dispute that prior to the four survivors being escorted down the stairwell, there was no search or secondary sweep of Flat 113 undertaken in accordance with standard LFB policy. The reasons for this not occurring are what are in dispute. The inquiry has received detailed written submissions on this disputed issue, including from Mohammed's family, and the chair has indicated in the phase one report at volume three, paragraph 15.96, an intention to give further more detailed consideration to the matter. It is not appropriate for me, therefore, to repeat the family's submission in this presentation, but it is right to briefly pause here to underscore to the panel the importance of the issue to Muhammad's family. When Omar al-Hajjali reached the ground floor at 02.45.02 and discovered that his brother had not come down with him, he can be seen on CCTV footage to immediately point frantically upstairs, imploring the firefighters to return to the flat. The reference for the image, timestamped at 02.47.19, is INQ 50449. Omar directly engages watch manager Williams and a number of other firefighters that surround him, telling them that his brother was still in flat 113. Omar's evidence to the inquiry in phase one was at day 59, page 87, line 21, to 89, line 3. In his words... I remembered asking them, where is my brother? And telling them maybe he's still in the flat. And I'm sure that he's still in the flat because he's not with me. And I pointed as well where I came from and I didn't see my brother. So they were just listening to me and I remembered someone asked me where you came from. I said 113 and he wrote that on my hand before I left the tower. At around 0255, Mahmoud al Quraj, now at the fireground, spoke to Muhammad al Hajjali on the phone, who told him he could not see Omar. Muhammad was in a state of distress, and he said he thought he was dying. He wanted Mahmoud to tell his family that he loved them and to ask his mother for forgiveness. Even though it was hard, Mahmoud tried to calm him and told him that, God willing, he would get out. Mahmoud spoke to Muhammad again at 0319, who told him that there had been eight people in the flat, but now there were four. Mahmoud implored his friend to leave, but Muhammad told him, quote, I can't leave. There is a mother and a child with me. How can I leave them? At this point, Omar also asked the LFB to keep hosing flat 113 with water, an issue that I will return to. Family and friends desperately sought to draw attention to the plight of the stranded residents in flat 113. Omar al-Hajjali, Mahmoud al-Qarad, and the brother's cousin, Asim al-Hajjali, amongst others, repeatedly informed police officers who were their first point of contact about those left in the flat. They were told that this would be passed on to the control room. As you will hear, Francis Dean and the Murphy family did the same. In the meantime, 
Zain Abdeen made two further 999 calls after being left in the flat. These were at 0306 and 0317, which will be described to you in the presentation later this morning. In summary, in the first call, Zainab described the occupants as covered in smoke. In the second call, CRO Housen advised her to cover herself with a towel and make her way down the stairwell. Zainab told her to expect to take, Zainab uh, uh, to, uh, was told to expect smoke in the stairwell. She appeared to agree to leave with Jeremiah and could be heard passing on advice to leave to another person in the flat. As you will hear further during the call, she was then heard to tell someone else in the flat not to open the door. She ended the call saying, no, we can't leave. Nobody is coming for us. Miss Munro, Queen's Council, will also deal in a later presentation with the efforts of Francis Dean, a friend of Zainab, who was in contact with Zainab throughout the night trying to assist her. For present purposes, Zainab began a final call with Francis Dean, likely soon after her final 999 call ended at around 0319. At some stage, Francis passed the phone on to a firefighter, crew manager Christopher Bouchador, who spoke to Zainab for a period of anywhere between an hour and an hour and a quarter. During the call, CM Bouchador relayed Zainab's location to watch manager Thomas Fernell. Zainab told CM Bouchador that she could not get out and be told to stay in the flat. As you will hear, 35 minutes into the call, Zainab told CM Bouchador that her son had died. Mr. Bouchador spoke to Zainab for another 35 to 45, 40 minutes after this. You will hear further about how this call ended, but in brief summary, there came a point when Zainab appeared to lose consciousness and there was silence for a period of minutes before CM Bouchador heard sounds consistent with the fire entering the flat. The line then went silent and he disconnected the call. The partial evacuation of flat 113 at 0245 and Omar raising the alarm that Mohammed had been left behind once in the lobby at 0247. Those are two figures we point out. The next dedicated deployment of firefighters to the flat was not until approximately 0304. It comprised firefighters Warnsby and Lowe. Warnsby's evidence was that they were simply given a post-it note which read flat 113, floor 14, with no further detail regarding the number or profile of the occupants they were being deployed to rescue. This crew was forced to abandon their flat 113 brief when they came across casualties found on the stairs. The next crew, tasked to attend floor 14, comprised firefighters Benetia and Hanlon. They were ready to go under air and assumed that they were going to floor 14 based on what was on a slip of paper. However, the deployment was abandoned due to the relocation of the bridgehead to the ground floor. Between around 0306 and 0324, no deployments were made to the relocate, due to the relocation of the bridgehead. Once deployments resumed, two subsequent crews of EDBA, or extended duration breathing apparatus wearers, were tasked to go to flat 113 at around 0325. As the phase one port report found at volume four, paragraph 28.114, both crews were inexplicably redeployed to fight fire and carry out general search and rescue on lower floors. The report characterised the decision not to use the EDBA crews to rescue the known stranded Floor 14 residents as a mystery. It also noted that crew manager Maine was excised by the decision at the time, but he felt constrained by his junior rank to disagree with the chain of command. Overall, the Phase 1 report described Flat 113 as, quote, a tragic example of the failure of the bridgehead to act on sound FSG information. There is no further available evidence of subsequent deployments to flat 113. 
a ground monitor was deployed at, on Grenfell Walk <coughs> on the south side of the tower from around 0241, which intermittently was reaching floor 14 with water. And the reference for that is the report by Professor Stoinoff, ISTRP um, 706, at pages 22, 103, 105 to 106, 130, and 149 to 151. Professor Purser has in turn identified in his phase two evidence how the application of water over this period may have had the capacity to slow the deterioration of conditions in flat 113 associated with the encroaching external fire spread and to provide a degree of protection. And the reference is section six of Professor Purser's reports at paragraphs 818 and 823. Family and friends who were in touch with Muhammad during the night have explained how he described water reaching flat 113, but then stopping. Muhammad made repeated desperate requests for the spraying of water to be resumed. It would appear that he focused on this monitor on the raised part of Grenfell Walk. Amar al al Khabib, a friend of Omar and Muhammad, who was present at the fire ground, approached a firefighter to relay Muhammad's request for the spraying of water to be resumed. The issue is dealt with in the phase one report at volume three, paragraph 19.36. The firefighter took Mr. Al-Khabib to the command unit. There, he told a firefighter where Muhammad Al-Hajali was and explicitly raised the fact that water had stopped being sprayed onto that part of the building. He recalls that the firefighter told him that he was not his job and asked him to leave. I pause to note that it is not clear if the cessation of spraying of water was a product of issues with water supply constraints or due to redirection of the water jet at around this time. Issues relating to the application of water to the exterior part of the tower have been considered in module seven. And for present purposes, it suffices to note that the link between those issues and events on flat 113 is a matter we would want the inquiry to consider. Omar al-Hajali recalls making a number of calls to Muhammad after he got out of the tower, but none after he was taken to hospital at around 0426. During this time, he was not only frantic with anxiety, but in an increasingly deteriorating physical state. Having learned about the fire, Hashem al-Hajali, the third brother, had arrived at the fireground. His account is dealt with in his witness statement of the 23rd of August 2017, and its reference on relativity is now MET 407745. Hashem initially saw Omar on the phone to Muhammad, trying to persuade him to leave. During this call, um, uh, the, uh, Omar was speaking, the phone that Omar was speaking on was passed over to Hashem, who was the last person to speak to Muhammad. Hashem recalls Omar shouting for Muhammad to come down, but Muhammad was saying he couldn't do it. Hashem describes Muhammad by this time speaking very slowly, like he had lost all energy. He told Hashem that the other people in the flat had stopped responding to him. While still on the phone, Hashem spoke to firefighters nearby and told them about his brother's location. Hashem thinks that he was in an area with the firefighters congregated for some 15 minutes, during which time Muhammad was asking for them to spray water on the flat. Muhammad was crying and asking to speak to their mother, but Hashem was worried that if he ended the call, he would not get it back through. He told Muhammad he could speak to their mother when he got out. Muhammad also asked him to play the Quran to him, and Hashem managed to do that by playing it on a speaker from his phone. Muhammad suddenly said, oh, the fire is here. I can see the fire. That was the last thing Hashem heard him say. Hashem then heard the sound of cracking, which he interpreted to be the sound of the fire. The phone cut off. 
Hashem al Ajali estimates that the call terminated between approximately 04.30 and 5 a.m., but the call log for the final call is unavailable. However, it stands to reason that this would have been around the same time as the end point of the Bouchador Dean call, in which CM Bouchador also appeared to have heard the sound of the fire entering the flat. CM Bouchador estimated that this would have occurred at, at some point after around 0430, 0435. It is known that Mahmoud al Qarad tried to call Muhammad eight times between 0426 and 505, but the calls went to voicemail. Muhammad al Hajali's body was found by watch manager Collins on the elevated area of Grenfell Walk. The walkway was visible from the windows of the bedroom and the living room of flat 113. Mr. Le Collins was located at the base of the tall 135 ground monitor ladder pitched near to the railings against the south elevation of the tower. This is where he saw the body of Muhammad lying face up with some debris covering him. Muhammad was entirely unresponsive and appeared to him to be dead. He and other firefighters moved the body to a protected area inside the lobby of one of the walkways. The final post-mortem report gave the medical cause of death as 1A multiple injuries consistent with fall from height. The report noted injuries both external and internal consistent with that outcome. The report records that these would have led to near instantaneous loss of consciousness and no protracted, protracted suffering. Muhammad had not suffered any burns. A toxicology sample revealed carboxyhemoglobin in Muhammad's body to be at a level of 50%, which was, is within the lethal range. This shows that Muhammad was dangerously near to death as a result of inhalation of toxic fumes from the fire at the time he fell. Post-mortem evidence also including findings of soot in Muhammad's airways indicating inhalation of fire fumes. Professor Purser explains that the fire spread outside the exterior of flat 113 at around 0333 and by 0352 the south face fire was outside the bedrooms and living room. He assesses that this would have meant that conditions in the living room were likely to have deteriorated rapidly from approximately that time and became non-survivable a further few minutes later. Professor Persa suggests that the cracking sound heard by Hashim al-Hajali may have been the sound of the fire breaking through the flat 113 south-facing living room window at this time. However, he notes that the exterior firefighting activities may have extended the period of survivability in the flat and estimates that the win time window for Muhammad falling to be between 4 a.m. and 0426 a.m. On this, Professor Person notes that the latter point is in time more consistent with the estimates of the endpoints of the final calls to flat 113 given by CM Bouchador and Hashim al-Hajali. Whatever the precise time of Muhammad's falling, it is abundantly clear that at that time he fell, Muhammad was faced with immediately life-threatening conditions in flat 113 and would have died there imminently had he not made a bid to escape. At a point in time when he was near to unconsciousness through smoke inhalation, he had come to the open window ledge as the last remaining place of survival. Evidence of potential relevance to the circumstances in which Muhammad came to fall is given by a paramedic, Russell Lobjoy, who describes seeing a male tying sheets from a flat on the south side of the tower around halfway up before losing his footing and falling. The reference is MET 301497, page 9. This may well have been Muhammad given the location and orientation of flat 113, especially when considered with the known attempt by Olu Talabi to escape by this means from flat 113 at an earlier point in the night, he did not fall. And no one else who fell from the tower that night is described as using sheets. Additional evidence of potential relevance is the location of the ladder 
and the location of where Muhammad's body was found, which is in keeping with him attempting to reach this elevated area, or indeed the ladder that extended up to the height of floor five. Given the desperate situation in the flat, this may well have seemed achievable from the window of flat 113. In any case, it may have presented to Muhammad the best chance of escaping a building alive, however slim. In 2014, Mr. and Mrs. Al-Hajjali sent their sons, the young men of the family, to a safe country away from Syria to avoid the perils of civil war. Three years later, one of their sons was dead. The other endured a highly traumatic near-death experience, and the third conducted a last call with Muhammad, desperately trying to convince his brother to escape. Muhammad al-Hajjali was the first victim of the fire to be buried in accordance with Muslim rites and by virtue of immense support by the East London Mosque. That was not before the degrading treatment of Muhammad's deceased body by photographs taken of it on the side of Grenfell Walk posted by members of the public onto the internet. Mr and Mrs al-Hajjali sent their sons to safety. They did not find it. In his kindness and his other many qualities, Muhammad, and indeed the other brothers and friends this inquiry has heard from, all represent the very best of those forced to leave their homes to start a better life. These are exceptional people, and we are so sorry that they have lost someone in Muhammad who was so loved and special to them. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. I think at that point we shall have a break and we'll resume, please, at 20 past 11. Thank you very much.
Yes, just a minute. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would now ask Ms. Alison Munro, Queen's Counsel, please, to come to the podium and to make the presentation on behalf of the family of Dennis Murphy from flat 111 on floor 14 of Grenfell Tower. As before, I would repeat the trigger warning. There may be matters discussed or presented uh, by Ms. Munro in her presentation, which people in this room or following on the live stream may find distressing. And if so, then they are free to leave the room uh, or to look away from the live stream, as the case may be. Subject to that, yeah. Ms. Munro. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Ms. Munro. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Stefan. Good morning, Mr. Akbar. I'd like to introduce, before I start, the family who are here. Present, we have Peter, who is Dennis's son. Next to Peter sits his mother, Tracy. Next to her is Brian. Next to him is Anne-Marie, Dennis's sister. Brian is Anne-Marie's partner. I miss a person for the moment. Next, to, at the end there, is Tim. Also watching online is Dennis's other brother, Mick. Last, and by no means least, and the person I've jumped over, is Anne. She is mother to Dennis, Anne-Marie, Tim, and Mick. And I've had special permission from Anne to let everyone know she's 80 years young. Thank you. The concept of home and what it means comes up all the time in literature, in poetry, films and music, phrases and idioms. We have so many for home. Home sweet home. Home is where the heart is. There's no place like home. Grenfell Tower was home to Dennis Murphy. Dennis came from a large, loving Irish family. He was born on the 10th of October 1960 in Hammersmith, London, and he was aged only 56 when he died. Dennis was one of four children, boys, himself, Mick and Tim, and one girl, Anne-Marie. As I said, at the centre of the family was their mother, Anne. Whilst not financially well off, Mrs. Murphy kept a beautiful home. Everything was in its right place, it was somewhere her children felt cared for, secured, protected, and loved. It was somewhere to be proud of. The brass on the letterbox always had to be polished and shiny. It was home. Anne Murphy, Dennis's mum, lived nearby Grenfell Tower, just around the corner, and they were very close. Dennis himself kept an immaculate flat. Again, everything was in its place, neat and tidy. Dennis would ring each individual member of his family on a set day each week to make sure that he had time for a proper chat with all of them. He was not a wealthy man, but he loved to share. When Dennis was awarded his disability living allowance, it was backdated. Dennis shared out that backdated payment a few hundred pounds with all his family. Dennis loved football and supported Chelsea. And he was delighted that his son Peter shared his passion for football. However, much to his disappointment and disbelief, Peter did not support Dennis's beloved Chelsea. Instead, young Peter, a child wise beyond his years, some may think, chose to support North London's finest, the mighty Spurs. In the absence of his own dad, Dennis, as the eldest child of the family, became a father figure to his younger siblings, Anne-Marie, Tim and Mick. In his inquiry statement, Tim described his brother Dennis as his best friend. The loss of Dennis has been immeasurable for the Murphy family. Anne-Marie has been left devastated and still suffers to this day. For Tim, Dennis dying simply broke his heart. He had to leave his job 
because he was taking so many days off. Some days he just couldn't get out of bed. The family told me that they had a barbecue this last weekend gone. Dennis would have been there, of course, had he been alive. There was an empty chair, and that was Dennis's. His love of his family was all-consuming. Anne-Marie says, he would squeeze you so tight, he just had to let you know how much he loved you by squeezing you. Dennis Murphy was a good man, and there's a lot to be said to being a good man. He was part and parcel and integral to the Grenfell community. And he was a resident of the tower for over three decades. He lived in a number of flats, flat 111 being the most recent and the last. In his statement to the inquiry, Anne-Marie's partner Brian stated that Dennis loved living in Grenfell Tower and knew all his neighbors extremely well. Brian says, I don't think he would ever move. Dennis claimed to have the best views in London and would always try to get me to visit on New Year's Eve so that we could see the fireworks. Dennis and Tracy married and lived together as a couple at Grenfell Tower. Dennis's mum, Anne, adored Tracy and always saw her as a daughter. She, Anne would say that she didn't have four children, she had five. Tracy was like a sister to Anne-Marie and to Tim and to Mick. Even after Tracy and Dennis divorced, it was amicable. Dennis used to stay at Tracy's house from time to time and they remained very good friends. Their son, Peter, lived with them initially at Grenfell and then after the relationship ended, he would still visit Grenfell Tower regularly. It became Peter's second home. He remembers, I spent weekends with my dad and have good memories of my time spent in Grenfell. Dad would let me roam on the other floors. It was a really friendly place and I would speak with many of the people living there. There were the football pitches at the bottom of the tower and the swimming pool was just around the corner from the tower. My dad was actively involved with the football activities and we used the boxing club a lot as well. Dennis would always say to Peter, you have to listen to your mother. And Dennis never contradicted anything that Tracy said when it came to parenting. Dennis was exceptionally proud of his son, Peter, and would have been so happy to see the wonderful young man that Peter has become. As I said, Dennis loved the panoramic views of London from his flat. He promised Anne-Marie's granddaughter that she could go and see the fireworks on New Year's Eve one day. After he died, she said, I'll never get to do that. When the family visited the flat after the fire, they asked the police to take photos of the view from the flat. But it was an empty shell. Nothing of Dennis remained. The scaffolding obscured that lovely view. It was simply not the same. It was no longer Dennis's home. Dennis had many friends in the tower. Some of his best friends included Tony Disson, Steve Power, who both sadly died as well, and Sharon Healy. He was not a man to push himself forward at the front and to speak at meetings, but he was a staunch and loyal supporter of the community and all they stood for, especially during the period of the refurbishment. Dennis would attend meetings of the residents and Willie Thompson and Ed Defarn told the family that Dennis was always there supporting the community. In his witness statement, Peter Murphy said that his dad supported the residents group and was very concerned about the refurbishment. His dad thought it was a form of social cleansing in West London to box in the community and to get them out. My dad was convinced that the council were trying to socially cleanse the area of the ordinary people like him who lived there. Constance Ting Grass, a local filmmaker, made a documentary called Grenfell, The Untold Story, which was shown on Channel 4 last year. In that film, he recorded the community two years before the fire, and it was shot during the refurbishment. There are scenes where residents meet with councillors, and Dennis can be seen in those scenes, along with Ed 
and Willie and Marcio Gomez and many others. Anne-Marie says in the film that Dennis would fight for what he believed in. She also said in the film that all that the only possessions the family had left were some of his coin collection recovered from the flat. The family treasure those coins. In the same film, Dennis's next door neighbor spoke about him. She spoke of how delighted she was when she found out she was going to live in Grenfell Tower. And then she met her neighbor, the lovely Dennis, who was so kind to her and her children. She said he was like an uncle to them because he knew that she was a single parent. He would knock on the door and tell her whether the lift was broken, when the water was gone. He was somebody who looked out for you. She jokingly added that Dennis went to every um, residence meeting, probably even more than Ed. One of the consolations that the Murphy family have in the aftermath of this tragedy is that meeting so many of the other survivors and finding out more about Dennis. Anne-Marie recalls all the stories and memories that survivors have shared with her and the family. Mohammed Nida's wife told the family that Dennis used to go to the lift on her floor with her shopping and carry her shopping to her front door for her and then go down back to his flat. Children were a fixture of Grenfell Tower and there was a time when the stairwells and lobbies reverberated to their laughter and their noises. Dennis loved that sound. Hanan Wahabi said Dennis always chatted to the kids. He was also so respectful there was no generation gap there. Dennis would say to the younger children, look after your mum, you only ever get one mum. In this, Dennis was emulating how he adored his own mother. Anne-Marie also found out, after the fire, that her eldest daughter went to school with Olu. Olu Talabi lived in flat 113. Those residents that were left behind became like a family. Dennis was yet another vulnerable resident of Grenfell Tower. He had arthritis, and more often than not, during the works to the, to the uh, tower, the only lift would be not working, and would, that would make it very difficult for people like Dennis to get in and out of the building. Anne-Marie went with Tracy for Dennis's assessment for arthritis. This was a few years ago when Peter was still at university and Dennis was granted that benefit. Dennis also had COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a name for a group of lung conditions where it's difficult to breathe air out of the lungs. COPD involves long-term chronic bronchitis and emphysema. These conditions can often occur together. In both conditions, the airways become narrowed. This makes it harder to move air in and out as you breathe, and your lungs are less able to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. The combination of disabilities all impaired Dennis's mobility and would have put him at greater risk from fire. Indeed, his ability to evacuate in the event of any emergency was greatly compromised. Dennis did not have a peep. Turning then to the events of the 13th and the 14th of June 2017, CCTV footage shows Dennis Murphy approaching the lift inside the tower on the 13th of June at 13.16. That would be the last sighting. In the early stages of the fire, when flames were accelerating up the east face of the tower, forcing the occupants of the sixes to leave, a number of the doors to those flats appears to have been left open due to the absence of effective self-closing devices. The inquiry has all already heard a lot about these particular doors and other doors where those self-closing devices were not fully functioning. As a result, smoke, which had been able to enter those flats, was able to get into the lobbies. Surviving residents of floor 14, including Omar Al-Hajali and Miss Nida Mangoba of flat 116, 
and the residents of flat 114, Alejandro Serrano and Robert Schwellings, have noted issues reflecting the defective front doors that were replaced during the refurbishment program, resulting in their failure to operate automatically or to close properly. Nida and her family were the only residents on that floor to self-evacuate. She lived at flat 116, one of the sixes. She had gone to bed around midnight on the evening of the 13th of June. Her husband and teenage son were already asleep. She awoke to the noise of an alarm and ran to the sitting room. Out of the window, she saw that there was fire blazing outside. She then went to the kitchen and could see there was an even more fire blazing outside her kitchen window. Before leaving her flat at 116, Nida went to collect her family passports from her bedroom. As she left the bedroom, she saw, quote, thick black smoke in her hallway from the ceiling almost to the floor. She noted that the smoke was coming into the bedroom and she had to cover her nose as the smoke was already there and it was black. The smell was unpleasant and bitter. Nita states that she was the last one to leave her flat and that she thinks she left the door open because in the rush to exit, she may not have pulled it closed. She goes on to explain that the front door of her flat was meant to be self-closed, but the mechanism um, that made it close automatically had been broken for some time. She had reported it on a number of occasions and it had been repaired, but it kept breaking and she'd given up reporting it as broken. Nida notes that upon running out of her flat, her husband and son were waiting for her in the lobby. She saw smoke in the lobby. It was thick black smoke, like the smoke in my flat. The smoke in my flat, in fact, was worse than the smoke in the lobby. The smoke in the lobby was light, like a cloud. I don't know where the smoke was coming from in the lobby. The smoke, nonetheless, was affecting our breathing as we pulled up our clothing to cover our faces, and we went to the door to go down the stairs. As we ran down the stairs, I could smell smoke, but did not see any smoke in the stairway. She is seen, and her family is seen, on the CCTV footage, leaving at 0129 Marlon, Junior, 45, 0129.46 Marlon, Senior, and Nida herself at 0129.48. Nida and her family having left, that meant that on floor 14, the residents of flat 111, Dennis, Flat 112, the Al Hajali brothers, Flat 113, Rosemary and Olu, and Flat 114, Zainab and Jeremiah, remained on the floor. They made a number of phone calls collectively. All were advised to remain and stay put. In response to Dennis's first phone call, a four person BA crew was dispatched to the 14th floor. That crew was made up from Kensington of firefighters Des Murphy and Charlie Cornelius, and from Acton, firefighters Nick Merrion and Harvey Saunders. We know from the records that firefighter Cornelius tallied out at 0151, firefighter Murphy at 0151.24, Merrion at 0151.13, and Saunders at 0150.57. At the time they were deployed, they were following and responding to the FSG that related to the call made from Dennis about 4.14. Dennis had made that call at 01.25.16. It was answered by CRO Norman. In that call, the following is said, the operator, emergency, which service, caller, Listen, there's a fire going on right outside my fire, police or ambulance, fire brigade love, there's a fire in the tower block. Operator, shouting fire? Yeah, I'm in Grenfell, tower love, and there's a fire going on. Operator, hold the line, you're in a queue waiting for them to answer. Caller, Dennis, hello? Operator, hello, fire brigade. 
Hall then is exchanged to the fire brigade. During his call to the actual fire brigade, which lasted three minutes and 57 seconds, Dennis added that he tried upon opening the door to leave, but there was a lot of smoke. The CRO, O.M. Norman, advised that if leaving meant using the stairwell, which she asserted wrongly were filled with smoke, he was better off staying where he was. Four minutes after Dennis's first 999 call, Zain Abdeen makes her first call at 0129. She states that she's alone with a baby. Timothy Murphy, Dennis's brother, states that he received a voice message from Dennis saying there was a fire in the flat and that he was in trouble. At 0136, Tim called back. Dennis answered immediately. Tim could hear from his voice that he was distressed and in a state of panic. Tim advised Dennis to get some air at the window, but Dennis said he could not do that due to the smoke. Tim told Dennis to leave the flat, but Dennis said it was pitch black and smoky in the lobby, so he could not do that. Tim himself called the emergency services, giving them all that information. On speaking to Dennis, Tim had told him that help was on its way and reassured his brother. Rosemary and Olu from flat 113 made their first emergency call at 0137.58. It lasted one minute and 13 seconds. Rosemary informed CRO Duddy at Bridgehead Control that she had a baby and that thick black smoke was coming through the letterbox. A smoke alarm could be heard in the background she said that she and her family had tried to escape, but the smoke was too thick in the lobby, so they had returned to the flat. Smoke was now coming through the door into her flat. Rosemary was advised to block up the doors and to keep the smoke out. CRO Duddy told her that the fire was on the third floor. Firefighter Lewis Wright notes that we were given a slip of paper with our task on it. The initial task handed to me was to go to the 14th floor to rescue people stuck by the lift. But when we went to the entry control officer, he informed us that our task had changed. He informed us that we would be going up with a crew of four and going to the fourth and fifth floors to carry out a search and rescue of any persons found. Standard breathing apparatus were also being used at the same time as us. And I remember questioning as I thought the SDBA before us had been committed higher up than us, but you never know what your task is, and now time was consuming. Dennis made a further 999 call at 0140. In that call, he explained that smoke was coming into the flat, through the windows and through the doors. He explained that his whole flat was now full of smoke. Caller, smoke. I can't move. My flat's full. There's smoke in the bathroom. Smoke coming through the windows and through the door. My whole flat is full of smoke. I'm locked in the bathroom. Operator, can you put some towels around the door to stop the smoke coming in? Caller, I can't. I can't get out. It's already full of smoke, thick black smoke. Tim Murphy called 999 and gave the operator Dennis's details including his name, flat number, and the fact that he was struggling to breathe. CRO Fox then took a call from Surrey Police Contact Centre, re reporting details of a trapped residence. This was after Dennis's brother, Tim, had spoken to Surrey Police and told them that Dennis was trapped in his bathroom and struggling to breathe. The smoke had been filling the room. CRO Fox created a service request at 0151 and CRO Darby passed that information to the incident ground at 0153. At the same time, CRO Housen took a call from Zainab Dean who said that all the rooms in her flat had smoke in them and the smoke was coming through the door and the window. Zainab then makes a call at 0148.23 from her flat, 115. Zainab told CRO Housen that she had a baby 
and the smoke was coming into her flat. CRO housed and told Zainab that the, the fire was on the fourth floor. Zainab re reiterated that smoke was coming into her own flat via the door and the windows. At, up to this point, the Al Hajali brothers had made no 999 calls. Meanwhile, at the bridgehead, firefighters were being briefed by watch manager O'Keefe. He told firefighters Murphy and Cornelius, quote, to go to the 14th floor. Murphy, firefighter Murphy says, he tasked us with a fire survival guidance, search and rescue on the floor 14 to locate a male who was in flat 111. That of course must have been Dennis. This male had called for firefighters saying that he could not get out of his flat and he was told to remain in his flat and that firefighters would come and reach him. Firefighter Des Murphy notes, when we got to the fire floor, five, the conditions on the staircase suddenly became really smoky. The smoke was intense, really thick and acrid. There was no visibility. Our radio communications were not working. And on our working channel, channel six, there was no response. Firefighters Murphy and Cornelius do arrive on floor 14 ahead of the Acton team. The first person that they see is Dennis in flat 111. Firefighter Murphy says this, inside flat 111, there was heavy smoke. It was logged as the lobby was, which was unsafe an area for the resident to be. At this point, Cornelius tried to radio down to the bridgehead that we had located Mr. Murphy, but the unsafe air in the lobby and the stairwell prevented us from removing him from the building. Our radio communication did not work. Firefighter Murphy also describes seeing the Al Hajali brothers at this point coming out of their flat 112. They cried, please help us. He says, I could see that the air in their flat looked clean, so I asked them to take the mail from flat 111 in and keep the door shut. That account is slightly at odds with the account from firefighter Cornelius. He says this, we banged on the door of flat 111, Dennis's flat. The gentleman was in his underwear. I would describe him as a white male, average build, middle aged with dark hair. He answered the door and he appeared confused. His flat was smoke logged. It appeared to me that the man was suffering from smoke inhalation because there was black soot on his eyes and nose and he was coughing as well. I then asked him if there was anyone else in the flat and he answered, my keys are in there. I thought he said, my kids are in there. I passed the gentleman to firefighter Murphy and went in and searched his flat. No one else was there. His flat was less smoky, but there was evidence of smoke in his flat by looking at the walls. It was breathable, but you would not want to spend too long in there. I came back out and I asked the man if there was anyone else in the flat. And then he said, his keys. We took the mail to the landing lobby. It was less smoky. By the time we came back out, however, the lobby area on the 14th floor, there were around four or five residents out of their flats standing in that area. Firefighter Cornelius says that a decision was made to move Dennis from his flat to 112, the flat of Omar and Mohammed. Omar describes the poor state that Dennis was in his face was black from the smoke. He was coughing and struggling to breathe. He looked like he was dying and he could not talk. Omar and Mohammed again asked the firefighters to take them down out of the building, but again they were told to stay put. Omar says in his witness statement, it was difficult for Dennis to walk he was moving very slowly, but he looked calm. He was struggling to breathe. 
Shortly after, the firefighters made a decision to move all of them from flat 112 to flat 113, the flat of Olu and Rosemary and their daughter. The rationale for that was that the air was cleaner. In his statement, firefighter Merian says this, he was with firefighter Saunders and they came to flat 112 first, the home of Omar and Mohammed. Initially, firefighter Merian went into the flat and spoke to the men, advising them to remain, but one of them came into the lobby and informed Merian that the smoke was inside their flat. Merian went back into the flat and says that he made a decision to move all the people on the 14th floor to one flat, as that was the safest thing to do. I don't actually know who made the actual decision, he says. Whoever made the decision, the net result is the same. Everybody ended up in Olu and Rosemary's flat, 113. So, flat 114 and 116, the home of Miss Mangoba and her family, there was no answer when the firefighters carried out their sweep because she had already left. Firefighter Murphy says that we informed the residents on the 14th floor who were now located in flat 113. Firefighter Cornelius and I had no radio working. We were running low on air and our breathing apparatus was low on air. We did not know what was going on in the rest of the building or outside the building. We'd only been on the 14th floor for a maximum of 10 minutes and we realized we needed to get out quickly and then return to the bridgehead as we were so low on air. We explained to the residents on the 14th floor who we had moved to flat 113 to stay in a safe place, in safe air, with the front door closed. Our decision to leave eight people in flat 113 was because of the conditions in the stairwell, where there was thick black smoke. If any of, one of them inhaled that smoke, that individual would not last long and would pass out. I don't think leading eight people down to the ground floor was an option, because they can't hold their breath that long. It was just leading them into their death and may have led to more bodies in the stairwell blocking up the way. He says, the better option was to leave them in flat 113 where there was clean air and to stay with the crew that came to assist while we go down to get another crew to come up and help them. And I was hoping that the fire would be contained in the compartment and conditions would get better while we went for help. Plus, I remember seeing a firefighter brought down when, there was, when we were going up, and the casualty with him was unconscious because he did not have breathing apparatus. My decision was 20% brigade policy and 80% on the conditions in the stairwell. By now, Dennis had been exposed to a lot of smoke, firstly in his own flat, then he'd been speaking with Cornelius and firefighter Murphy whilst in the smoke log lobby. He'd been with the Al Hajali brothers. He'd been moved via the lobby to Rosemary and Olu's flat. He was exhausted. Upon getting to Rosemary and Olu's flat, Rosemary describes Dennis's appearance thus. His face was dark and covered in thick black soot. I didn't recognize him at first. His face was so covered in soot. He was quiet and clearly in abject shock. Rosemary had to ask Lu Olu, who is this man? Olu said, it's Dennis. Rosemary continues, he looked dazed and confused and shriveled. Rosemary went and got some water and she cleaned Dennis's face and eyes and she gave him a tissue to blow his nose. Firefighter Murphy had attempted to radio the bridgehead to tell them what they had done, but he was unable to do so. By this stage, both the control room and the firefighters in the tower were aware of the smoke ingress into Dennis's flat, Zainab's flat, Omar and Muhammad's flat, and into flat 113 itself. Firefighter Merian recalls that he was instructed to tell the residents to stay in the flat. 
He had spoken with the Al Hajali brothers, who he described as being very agitating, agitated and wanting to leave. But he told them to stay put. That was the policy where the fire was not in the flat. Firefighter Saunders says he told the residents that they were safe where they were. Omar states in his witness statement that he and his brother pleaded with Marion and asked to take them with them, take them out with them, even asking Marion if they had any masks or breathing equipment that they could use to assist their evacuation. Marion replied he did not have any. Firefighter Saunders spoke to Olu and Rosemary and gave them the same stay put advice. By 2 a.m., Dennis Zainab Rosemary had between them made six 999 calls. They all indicated the same thing to the operators. They all told the operators none of them felt able to leave their flat due to the thick smoke on floor 14. Time was going on. Rosemary noticed that Dennis was becoming weaker. By now, the rest of the family became involved. At around 2.30, Anne-Marie's house phone began to ring. Eventually, her partner, Brian, answered it. It was her brother, Tim. He said that he'd spoken to Dennis and there was a fire in his flat and it sounded bad. Immediately, Anne-Marie called Peter and Tracy and told them to meet her by the car. Together with Brian, they all drove to the tower. En route, Anne-Marie called Dennis on his mobile and she and Peter briefly spoke to him. Dennis told Anne-Marie that he was now in a neighbor's flat having been moved by firefighters. Anne could hear a woman in the background shouting and saying she needed an ambulance. Anne also noticed that Dennis's breathing was laboured. She was distressed by what she could hear. She told her brother to put a wet towel over his face and to lie down on the floor. She handed the phone to Peter. Peter told his dad to do as Auntie Anne had said. When Peter spoke to Dennis on the phone, Dennis said, Boise, Boise, I can't breathe, I'm stuck, I can't get out, I don't know what to do. Dennis always called Peter Boise. Peter could hear people screaming in the background on the phone. He told his dad, we're coming. In his witness statement, Peter says this. I was really upset at this point. I could hear him coughing and the people screaming and someone saying, we need an ambulance. I now believe that was Zain Abdeen saying, I need an ambulance. This was the very first time, and indeed the last time, that I'd heard my dad so scared. I said to him, Dad, we're coming to get you right now. Please put the fan on your face to help you breathing. That was my last conversation with my dad, although I didn't think so at the time that it would be my last conversation. When I composed myself, I tried phoning him again. His phone just kept ringing out. He did not pick up. When they got to the tower, around about 3 a.m., Peter, Tracy, and Anne could see the full extent of the horrific fire. Peter jumped out of the car and ran off. Tracy ran after him. Peter got as far as the police cordon. He says this, the scene was chaotic. There were lots of people around. Some of them were on their phones and talking and videoing. Some were just stood there watching. There were people screaming. And I remember the buzz of what I think was a helicopter above us. There was stuff floating off the tower and landing on the cars. The smell was awful. My eyes were stinging from the heat. There were sirens blasting out, flashing lights. The heat was immense. Peter spoke to the policeman and told him about his dad and him being moved to a neighbor's flat on the 14th floor. 
Peter goes on. The police officer told me that they, I presume he meant the firefighters, that they'd got to the 20th floor and that people were being brought out and going to an ambulance on Clarendon Road. He told me to take myself down there as my dad might be there. Peter did, in fact, bump into Ed Defarne. Ed had heard Peter speaking to the, fire, to the police officer and mentioning his father. But Peter was in his own world by now, and he didn't remember what Ed said to him, and he walked off. Anne-Marie and Brian spoke to firefighters at the scene, and they eventually found Tracy and Peter on Clarendon Road. Mick, by this time, and Anne-Marie had also spoken on the phone. Mick told her to go round to their mother's Anne, so they all went over to her house. Later that morning, Tim and his partner also arrived at Anne's house. Whilst the family were outside, inside the tower, firefighter Murphy had reached the bottom. I met with watch manager O'Keefe and I informed him of what we had done on floor 14 and that there were eight residents currently in flat 113. In the bridgehead, I could see that a senior officer, an assistant divisional officer, was now present, standing by the two entry control boards, which showed the number of firefighters present and who were wearing breathing apparatus. There were lots of people around and queues of firefighters waiting. I then realized the incident was much bigger than we initially thought. I could see there were a number, another person writing information on the wall. I thought, I just need to go outside. So having given the details and debriefed watch manager O'Keefe, he saw watch manager De Silva write on the wall. The photographs um, of the walls and the boards that were shown this morning during the presentation on behalf of Mohammed al Hajali referred to one of the photographs of the wall on the third floor. And there we can see on a close up of that that firefighters had written the floor number and the number of people. Firefighter Murphy says, once he got outside, I turned to look at the tower and could see that it was now engulfed in flames. I could hear the fire crackling, and I could see it was spreading towards the northeast of the tower. The fire was nearly to the top of the northeast corner. I could see thick black smoke billowing from the tower. The exterior panelling was coming off, and the fire looked to be quite extensive. So, in the phase one report at volume four, Paragraph 213, it says this. Flat 113 provides a tragic example of the failure of the bridgehead to act on sound FSG information. We've heard in the presentation this morning what happened at the door once the next group of firefighters, Orchard, and Herrera reached the 14th floor. What is particularly tragic for the Murphy family is that whatever the conversation was, and there, there is a dispute, whatever that conversation was, Dennis was not part of it. He was not at the door. He, Zainab, Jeremiah, and Mohammed were the forgotten ones in flat 113. Dennis made no further 99 calls. His family heard nothing more from him. It is likely, but we cannot say for certain, that Dennis remained in the company of Zainab and Jeremiah. His condition, no doubt, became weaker and weaker. In those final hours in flat 113, the Murphy family will always be grateful to Omar, his late brother Mohammed, to Rosemary, to Olu, 
to the late Zainab Dean for being with Dennis. They looked after Dennis and they tried to help him. The rest of the family were all now at their mother Anne's home. In the coming hours and the coming days, they sought information about Dennis and his fate. <coughs> Anne lives in West London, and it was her eldest daughter who went to school with Olu, who actually was the conduit through which information was found. A friend of Olu's had messaged him to let him know that Anne was looking for her brother. The family met with Olu and he told them about the events of the night. Moving on to the evidence of Professor Purser, he details particularly Zainab, Dean, Jeremiah and Dennis together. And he says this, from around 3.35, the conditions in flat 113 deteriorated rapidly in terms of increasing smoke and exposure to asphyxiant gases. And in the living room and kitchen area, very rapidly when the exterior fire spread outside the south living room from approximately 03.52. During this period, the occupants were increasingly affected by the uptake of asphyxiant gases so that in terms of sequence, Jeremiah, as a child, would have first become unresponsive and then died. After this, Dennis Murphy, and then Zainab, who would have become unresponsive, and they would have died approximately 0345. Whilst there is some difference in detail regarding the exact sequence and timing of these events, essentially, the features are relatively clear. Dennis had been moved from one flat to another. He had remained in the lobby for a few minutes. From the descriptions that other give of Dennis's conditions and the firefighters' descriptions, he had clearly suffered significant smoke exposure in his own flat by the time he was moved and was quite badly affected by the inhalation of irritant smoke particles, causing coughing and breathlessness. He will have inhaled some asphyxiant gases, but Dr. Professor Purser says he was still able to walk and was not showing obvious signs of asphyxiant intoxication at that time. At some point, most likely after the exterior fire was outside flat 113 bedrooms, and that would have been approximately 0333, when flame and smoke had penetrated the bedrooms, but before flames spread outside the living room, it is likely that Dennis and Zainab became semi-conscious and unresponsive due to the inhaled dose of asphyxiant gases, especially that inhaled after 0333. During this period, the pattern of smoke exposure will have resulted in a slow uptake of asphyxiant gases with a slow increase in blood, COHB, up to approximately 333, and then a more rapid increase up to 352 over the period approximately until 0400 hours. The description of the conditions from the phone calls show that all these three occupants were affected by the incapacitating effects of inhalation of asphyxiant gases. Dennis's remains were recovered from flat 113 in the kitchen area. He was lying on his left side towards the door from the kitchen to the hall of the flat. Anne-Marie Murphy says this. Dennis taught his family to never look away from people's pain. His lesson was simple. Don't look away. Don't look down. Don't pretend not to see hurt. Look people in the eye, even when their pain is overwhelming. And when you are in pain, find the people who can look you in the eye. 
the family ask all of us here today to take a moment to look them in the eye. Anne-Marie says, we need to know we are not alone. See our pain and our hurt of losing Dennis. It's still so immense. It has been said that time is a great healer, but the family are still waiting to heal. Each day there are moments when they realize there is a part of them missing. Sometimes it's manageable, sometimes it's not. Dennis's home is gone. The image of Grenfell Tower is now one that is seared in the public consciousness. It is that of a burnt out shell, unrecognizable from the homes that, that once were there. Mrs. Murphy once said to her daughter, I might not live to see justice serve. We are glad that she is still here and she is still fighting for her son. The celebrated architect Bertolt Lubetkin was a pioneer of British modernism. He designed council houses and health centres and leisure centres for working class people in North London over 80 years ago. Many of these buildings are now listed buildings. At the opening of one of his most beautiful designs, the Finsbury Health Centre, in 1938, he said his now oft quoted words, nothing is too good for ordinary people. As Peter Murphy remarked, his father was an ordinary man living in an area of ordinary people. Nothing was too good for Dennis Murphy and his neighbors. They all deserved a good, safe place to live. Anne has also been asked many times how she feels and how does she describe losing her brother? And she describes it thus. Since Dennis's death, one of my answers is, it feels like never being able to find your way home again. And what makes it even harder is that Dennis will never find his way home again either. His home was flat 111 Grenfell Tower. I will end with the words of the family. And these words, they've written directly to their brother Dennis. Dennis, we wish you knew how much of you there is in everything we do. It can be the smallest thing, but you're here, under the surface, somewhere. We wish you knew how we carry you with us everywhere and always. Our precious memories of you will be cherished forever. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Munro. Um, <coughs> now, at this point, we shall have a break. Um, sir, can we have a shorter break? Um, yes. How long do you think would be appropriate? Um, Twenty minutes. Yes, all right. Oh, we should... Perhaps 15. Should we say 25 to, to 1? Yes, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. 25 to 1, then, please.
Yes, Mr. Millett. Mr. Chairman, I would now invite uh, Ms. Alison Munro, Queen's Counsel, to come back to the podium, please, and to make the presentation on behalf of Zainab Dean and Jeremiah Dean from flat 115 on floor 14 of Grenfell Tower. And as before, I would just make the trigger warning again that during the course of this presentation, there may be discussion or material uh, which is distressing to people in the room or following on the live stream. And to them, I would say that if they wish to leave the room, then they should do so now or to look away from the live stream. Similarly, subject to that, Ms. Munro, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Munro. Thank you, sir. Sir, panel, um, can I just start by introducing Francis, who's here in person. He is a good friend of Zainab, and I will be referring to him. And you may recall reference to Francis from phase one. Zainab's mother, Hannah, is not in the country, so cannot be with us here today. Her father is watching remotely, as is her sister, Salma. The pictures that we've just looked at are very lovely pictures indeed. They show a beautiful young woman, Zainab, and a gorgeous little toddler, Jeremiah, mother and child. Putting aside stereotypes of traditional parenting roles, the image of a mother and child, and motherhood generally, are powerful, iconic, and enduring ones across cultures and time. Religions all over the world, whether Christian, Judaic, Hindu, Islam, Islamic, all accord a very important place to the concept of motherhood. Zainab Dean loved being a mother. Jeremiah was truly her pride and joy. She was born on the 25th of May, 1985, in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Zainab spent her childhood years there and then moved to England when she was about 15 or 16. At the commemoration hearings, her family described her as a beautiful, smart, warm, caring and confident young woman. She had a lively personality and her great sense of humour was enjoyed by all who came across her. Zainab was a much-loved mother, daughter, sister, niece, granddaughter and cousin. She is survived by two other children, her father Zainu Dean, her mother Hannah Thomas, her cousin Etaju Dean and her stepmother Maria Dean and her sister Salma Dean. Her cousin Linda saw her regularly and she says this about Zainab. I knew Zainab more than most people. She was very social. When she died, even in America and back home, a lot of people knew about her. She was very religious and used to like going to church and spent a lot of time there. She liked to help out with the church. Linda goes on. Zainab was very kind. She liked helping people, including those who had nowhere to go. She would help homeless people in the community and offer them her own sofa in her own home whilst they got themselves sorted. Any time you go to Zainab's house, there was someone there on her sofa or in her spare room, even in Grenfell. She was very generous, very family-oriented, she didn't have anything herself, but she was always helping others. Zainab liked to go out and eat. She was funny, she made people laugh. She liked dancing, she loved music. I liked going out with her, shopping, dressing. She was always smiling. Anywhere Zainab goes, there would be fun. People liked her. 
One of the most enduring memories that Linda has is that Zainab was a happy person. And when you were around her, you're happy. She was just one of those people who was very sociable. Anywhere she went in London, there would be somebody who knew her. And Linda met a variety of people after Zainab died who all knew and loved her. Linda gives another anecdote. At Grenfell, there was a person, a man, who was having some issues with his family and his wife, and he got kicked out. And Zainab let him stay with her for a month or so. This was just before the fire. Her mother, Hannah, says this. Zainab was the only child I gave birth to. When she came to England, she was always sending me money and things like that that I could sell because she knew how hard life was for me back in Sierra Leone. I was living in a village and life in the village was very hard. We had different ways of keeping in touch. If someone was traveling to Sierra Leone, she would find out and tell them to come and see me and bring me something. If I could get somewhere by a telephone, I would call her. Lately, I've been able to use the internet on other people's phones to get in touch with her. And she recently sent me a phone myself so I could call her. It was hard, but like I say, she was always with me and I know she always had me on her mind. I don't know the details of what happened to my daughter and my grandson. She'd called me on the Monday to tell me she was sending me some money on Tuesday for rent. She put Jeremiah on the phone and he said, I love you, Gan Grana. But by Tuesday, they were both dead. Someone called asking if I was Zainab's mum, but no one gave me any information. I was too scared to ask. I'm too hurt, it's overwhelming. I can't believe that she's gone and I can't believe that I'll never get to see Jeremiah again. I just want to see my grandchild. I'm so scared and lonely and I have no support. All I know is that my daughter and her son died in a terrible fire in the middle of London, far from me. I can't believe it would happen there, like that. A mother's love is very precious, and the same for me as everyone anywhere in the world. I lost a daughter that I gave birth to, and my baby grandson. I wish I could see my grandchildren. They are the only branch of my roots that are left. Francis was present on the night of the fire and watched from the outside of the unfolding scene. He says this about Zainab. Over time, Zainab told me a lot about her life. She had a really difficult life. She struggled, but she was so bubbly and fun and her energy and enthusiasm was infectious. Despite her hardships, she found faith and was happy as a born-again Christian. Francis goes on and says, that gave her purpose and participation in so many churches that when she passed away in Grenfell Tower, many churches held services in her memory. She was part of many congregation. She was like champagne, very bubbly. Jeremiah. Jeremiah Dean was born in December 2014 in London. He was only two years old when he died. His life was only just starting. As a toddler, he was beginning to explore and appreciate the world around him, and he loved football. Two years old, that's an age where children are walking and talking and sometimes talking back. They are growing out of their infancy and into childhood. However, they're still very young. And when a two-year-old cries, they cry like a baby. When they're in pain, they show their pain like babies. They want to be held in your arms and they want to be cuddled and told everything will be all right. Linda shared this memory of Jeremiah. He was very clever and a happy child. He was social like his mum and liked to be around people. I used to babysit a lot for him. I saw them both on the 13th of June, but just briefly, that was the last day. We had fun on that day. I was taking my child to nursery, so me and Zainab met halfway, 
as she took Jer Jeremiah to nursery. We were laughing, we had ice cream. We went to the shop and we bought more ice lollies. It was a really hot day. We were just laughing. It was a beautiful day with a bad ending. Sir Panel, like so many that we've heard about in the last two weeks, Zaina had her vulnerabilities. Her family want her background to be known and the hardships she faced so that people can see the full picture of who Zainab was, but also how far she came and what she overcame. Life for Zainab was never easy. She had learning disabilities and some mental health difficulties. There were doubtless these were exacerbated by other traumas that she encountered in her young life. She had already escaped an unhappy and tormented first marriage. Additionally, her older children did not live with her and this caused Zainab immeasurable pain and made her even more protective of Jeremiah. She was determined to make a life for both of them and show people that she could cope. She had also experienced homelessness and unemployment. No doubt again, her mental health had been exacerbated and impacted negatively by those experiences and the many other difficulties and challenges she encountered in her life. But Zainab persevered. She got a tenancy in flat 115 Grenfell Tower on the 14th floor. That was late 2015 and it was a tenancy in her sole name. For someone who had experienced homelessness in the past, having her own flat was just wonderful. Zainab had been unemployed, but very recently she'd been offered a new job as a waitress. Francis remembers Zainab dancing for joy at the prospect of a new job. She was due to start on Monday the 19th of June 2017. Things were finally on the up for Zainab and Jeremiah. She had created a home for herself and her beloved son. She would have a job. They were happy. The last person to see Jeremiah and Zainab was Francis. According to Francis' inquiry statement, he dropped Zainab and Jeremiah off at Grenfell Tower around 9.30, 10 p.m. on the evening of the 13th of June. CCTV footage shows Zainab and Jeremiah together in the lift lobby. They were waiting to go up to the building. This was at 23.20, 17. During the course, sir, of the previous two presentations this morning, you've heard a great deal of detail about the circumstances and the condition on floor 14. Mr. Friedman, Queen's Council, has set the scene and explained the rapid fire spread, the defective doors, and the objective conditions on floor 14. In the last presentation, sir, I told you about the numerous phone calls that have been made by Dennis Murphy and Rosemary from flat 113. In this presentation, sir, I will therefore concentrate on the calls that were made by Zainab Dean herself. Her first call is made at 01.29.02. Here we have Zainab, a scared, vulnerable young woman, alone in her flat with her two-year-old son, Jeremiah. The flat is being compromised by smoke. And as the fire continues to spread on the exterior of the tower, she remains in her flat. So as I mentioned yesterday, one thing that has been absent in the main part from the inquiry are the sounds of the night. For Zainab, this, the sounds of the night would have been particularly terrifying. They were loud, they were constant and unrelenting, and they went on for hours and hours and hours. That is what Zainab, and indeed two-year-old Jeremiah, would have been exposed to. It is clear, even from her first call at 0129, that Zainab found the whole situation petrifying, and it caused a heightened sense of anxiety and fear within her. 
that was coupled with an all-consuming desire to protect and not lose Jeremiah. When she made her first call, she begged for help. She advised that she was in floor 14 and the fire was coming into the building and she said, I've got a baby with me. Eight minutes later, at 0137, Zainab again calls, makes a 999 call. This time it's answered by Sierra Adams. The smoke alarm is audible in the background of the call. After repeatedly stating that she was on the floor 14, Zainab describes smoke coming in under the door and through the windows and fire coming from the door. Ciaro Adams advised Zainab to block the door, shut the window, and informed her that someone will soon come and get her out. The operator tells Zainab to stop shouting and calm down. Remember, this is a young woman with learning disabilities and ill mental health. Now, of course, Ciaro Adams would not have known that, but her sense of heightened anxiety with her flat being compromised by smoke, it's not surprising that she was shouting and not calm. It's difficult to remain calm when your baby's life is at risk from smoke and fire raging on the exterior of the building. Zainab was deeply distressed. She and her child begged for help. She told the operator, I'm going to die and I feel like jumping. A minute later, Zainab made a telephone call to Francis Dean. She told him, there's a fire. And she said, I'm with Jeremiah. And the firefighters are in the tower. At this stage, it's perhaps rem worth remembering Professor Purser's analysis that it was still possible to safely evacuate from floor 14. Zainab then contacts the emergency services again, 014717. She says, once again, I have a baby with me. Jeremiah remains her primary concern. She talks about the fire and the smoke. Caller, I have a baby. There's fire in the flat. There's screaming, obvious panic smoke present in the flat via the door and windows. From the summary from the coroner's report, it says, the call handler makes a note, difficult to understand, possibly African, advised by call handler to block the smoke and stay where she is. Less than a minute later, 0148, 23. Zainab makes another call. This time, Ciara Hausen took the call. Operator tells the caller that the fire is not on the 14th floor and asks if there's something coming into the flat. Caller, Zainab, yes, yes, there is smoke in all the rooms. I have a baby. Smoke is coming through the door. Operator tells her to put blankets and towels to stop the smoke. Caller, Zainab, I've already done that. Operator tells her, we'll just continue doing that to stop the smoke. Zainab says, the smoke is coming from the window and the door. The windows are closed. All the rooms in the house have smoke. The operator says, well, tell the fire brigade to come as soon as they can. They will come and they will take you out safely. The operator also tells Zainab that there are a hundred firefighters and 25 engines there. They're coming to make sure everyone is safe. It is important to note, Zainab's family say, that in this and other calls, Zainab is told the fire is on the fourth floor. Zainab reiterates that smoke is coming into her flat via doors and via the window. Effectively, Zainab is being told that she is wrong and she should disbelieve the sight of her own eyes and the smells of her own nose and the sounds of her own ears. 
One can only imagine how those words, you're wrong, the smoke, the fire is not on your floor, would have been received by someone like Zainab, who is learning disabled with a history of mental ill health. She tells the call operator that there is smoke in every room. Once again, Jeremiah was paramount in her thoughts and, Jer and Zainab tells the CRO, I have a baby with me. She, adv she is advised that the crew have been told that they are coming and they will get her out soon, as soon as it's safe to do so. We know from the evidence of firefighters Cornelius and Murphy and the Acton crew that came up just behind them that a decision is made for all the occupants on the 14th floor that they find to go to Olu and Rosemary's flat. At 020140, an MPS operator made a call back to Zainab regarding, quote, large fire at your location. The operator asked Zainab if she's able to get out, to which Zainab responded, no, how can I get out? The operator asked whether there was a fire escape and Zainab responded, there isn't one, and that she needed help. Once again, Jeremiah is on her mind and Zainab tells the operator she has her son with her. This operator tells her to calm down. Zainab is clearly agitated and distressed. She's advised that the fire brigade is coming up the stairs and they're trying to evacuate everyone. And, and she asks Zainab to look out because they will soon be there. Zainab explains that she couldn't go out and look, the smoke was coming in. At that point, the MPS operator advises Zainab three times to go to the window and wave to the police helicopter. Sir, you will have heard again from the presentation for Dennis Murphy about the fire spread and the evidence of Nida, the neighbor who self-evacuated. It's worth noting that firefighter Marion is the only one who says of the briefing that he and his colleagues received from the bridgehead that, quote, we were told to effect FSG rescue calls on the 14th floor. That's a more general briefing. This meant that the advice was that it was deemed to be safest to get occupants to stay in their flat. We were told to give the residents that advice on the 14th floor. Firefighter Saunders, who accompanied him, explains that the team were given no specific details of the occupants in the flats on the 14th floor. He says this, I was not given any information of the condition on the floor or the flat we would attend or who we would be attending on in relation to numbers. And so it appears he did not know what to expect. He goes on further to say, no indication or belief was, get, was made that the fire would have spread to the 14th floor. My belief was that we were to attend a flat and to tell those people what we always say in this situation, and that was to stay put, and we would deal with the fire. I never doubted this to be the right thing to say, as I do not believe people would get down the stairs conscious due to the conditions. So again, you've heard earlier how Rosemary in particular, once they were all in her flat, was very concerned for Dennis and Zainab. She washed Dennis's face. She hugged Zainab and she picked up Jeremiah. She describes Zainab as deteriorating. So Zainab was put into the bedroom and she sat on Rosemary's bed. According to Rosemary, Zainab was almost hysterical now. She was crying and telling me she wants to keep her baby, that she had fought so hard for her baby and she didn't want to lose him. She didn't want to lose her baby and she didn't want her baby to die. It was now gone 2 a.m. At 02.09.25, Ciaro Gotts took a call at 
Aid control room from the MPS control room reporting that they had received an abandoned call from a female who was trapped with her son in flat 115, that's Zainab's flat, and states that she does not know where the exits are. The MPS CRO gave a CAD reference number for that call. CRO got states that the advice was to close the windows and block up the door, but if windows offer air, the resident was to open them. The MPS controller asked if the brigade are not directing people to fire escapes and CRO got explained that they do not know where the escapes are or the exits and she had spoken to a few people who had left but they had to return to their flats because of the smoke. CRO Gotts explains that as the fire is unpredictable, the brigade do not generally tell people to leave but if they think they can leave safely, they are to do so. The MPS CRO asked CRO Gotts if she can arrange for the brigade CRO supervisor to speak to the MPS supervisor in the MPS control room. CRO Gotts said she would try her best, but they were very busy at the moment. At 0210, Northwest Fire Centre took a call via a BT operator who passed over a female caller who was outside the tower and reporting about the fire. The, the caller said that there were people on the 14th floor on the west side of the building and she specifically wanted to clarify that there was a woman who was screaming and banging on the windows about her kids. The, the Northwest Fire Centre operator stated that he would pass the information on to the brigade. We know there were two children in flat 113, Rosemary and Olu's daughter and of course Sarah and Jeremiah. Zainab then rings her friend Francis again, telling him that the conditions in the tower were getting worse. Francis has provided a witness statement to the inquiry in phase one. Upon receiving Zainab's call, he makes two 999 calls himself. He's en route to the tower. In the second call, Zainab um, in respect of Zainab, Francis tells them that he's calling because of a friend. He says, she's, people are dying in the high rise. The operator asks, are you in the high rise? Francis says, no, I'm outside. Zainab is trapped in there and he doesn't know what's happening. She's with her son, a little boy. The operator says, what, are they on the 11th floor? Or the, Francis interrupts, they're on the 14th floor. Operator, we're going to let the firefighters know. Francis says, they're all there and nobody's doing anything. Operator, we've got 40 fire engines there. I can tell the firefighters what number and the floor they're on. Francis replies, I'm going to try and call her back again and see whether or not she's still trapped. Operator, let us know. Northwest Fire Service again calls back Zainab at 0221, an earlier connection having failed. Zainab tells them that she's now in flat 113. There is no record that the information was passed on to the LFB, although by that point, Zainab would have already been moved into flat 113. At approximately 0223, a crew comprising of firefighters Cook and Flanagan happened to enter flat 113 as they returned from a higher floor. They had just heard in Dennis's presentation about them. This Further BA crew was deployed just before BA crew 25, consisting of firefighter Orchard and Herrera, and BA team 26, consisting of firefighter Juggins and McCalmon. The briefings were mixed in terms of the flat numbers, the FSG calls, and the number of residents, adults and children. At the same time that this deployment was ongoing, 
at 02.31.49, CRO Gotzigen at Brigade Control took a call from a female who said she was on the 14th floor and that there was now fire on the top. CRO Gotz tried to confirm if she meant the fire is on top of the building or on top of her flat, and the caller stated it was on top of her flat. There was a loud scream, and then a man moaned, and then another scream. The caller then shouted, look at the fire, and Ciara Gotts tried to confirm if the fire was in the caller's flat. The caller explained that they can't get out because they were told to stay inside, but she went on to explain that the fire will come into the flat. Ciara Gotts advised that they were to get out if they could. If not, block up the exits and move away from where the smoke is. The line cleared without any further responses from the caller. As I mentioned in the previous presentation for Dennis Murphy, he, Zainab, Jeremiah and Muhammad can be perhaps called the forgotten ones from flat 113. Once he was back downstairs, one of those firefighters, CM McGlonan, said this, I confirmed with the entry control board officer that three people had been rescued from flat 113, but I could not confirm that it was empty as we had, had escorted people out from the landing and not searched the flat. Time pressed on. At 030606, CRO Russell took a call from someone in flat 113 on the 14th floor. It took some time to ascertain the flat number. It was a female caller. She was shouting that someone was unconscious. CRO Russell asked her where she was in the flat, but the caller's response was not clear. CRO Russell then asked, were there flames in the flat? And the caller said yes. CRO Russell told the caller to try and get away from the flames and asked if she was able to leave. The caller said she couldn't leave and then the line cut off. This must have been Zainab because we know that Rosemary was evacuated with Herrera and Orchard BA crew. Some 11 minutes later at 03.17.05, CRO Housen took a call from Zainab. She was now shouting. She was hysterical. She was reporting fire in the flat. Ciaro Housen advised Zainab to leave with wet towels over her face and use a stairwell, which was full of smoke. Zainab explained that she had a baby with her, and Ciaro Housen told her to cover the baby with a wet towel. Zainab appeared to be talking to another person and passing on the advice. It is likely this would have been either Muhammad or Dennis. She then said, okay, and CRO Housen ended the call. Two further calls were made from flat 113, but the timings were unclear and the callers could not be identified. In one call, the operator tells the caller that the fire brigade were coming. The fire is coming, said the caller. The fire is coming, the fire is coming. Operator, are you in Grenfell Tower? Caller, yes. Operator, okay, I'm connecting you to the fire brigade and you need to try and leave your apartment and cover yourself with a wet towel. In the second call, which again, caller is not clearly identified and the timings are unclear, is a call to the fire brigade from flat 113. Caller one, don't open the door. Operator, stop shouting, stop shouting. What flat are you in? There's lots of back and forth between the operator and the caller. Operator, listen to me, listen. You're talking too loudly and too quickly. You need to slow down. There's then lots of over speaking. Operator, is there any fire where you are? Caller, yes. There's flames? Caller, yes. Okay, you need to get away from the flames. The best, are you able to leave? No, we can't leave. Nobody is coming for us. There's no reply after that. 
Zainab makes one further conversation during a phone call, and that is with CM Batcheldor. CM Batcheldor was outside the tower. He noticed Francis Dean speaking on his mobile phone, and he approached him. He ascertained that Mr. Dean was speaking to a person who was trapped in flat on the 14th floor. So the evidence relating to this call is highly distressing. Um, the family have been warned, but I raise that again for those in the room and those watching remotely. Francis speaks to Mr. Batcheldor whilst he's on the phone to Zainab, and at some one point he passes the phone to CM Batcheldor. CM Batcheldor says as follows. I took the phone from Francis and spoke to the woman. She said, my name is Zainab. I am with my son. I'm on the 14th. She gives her own flat number, which is flat 115. I said, stay on the phone with me. At that point, watch manager Tom Fennell was dealing with fire survival calls from a, a position outside the building, so I asked for his advice. He told me that the call from Zainab had already been recorded, so I told her, we know where you are, we're coming up. I asked what it was like in the flat, and she said it was smoky. So I told her to go to the least smoky room, shut the door, and put clothing down at the bottom of the door. I told her to lie on the floor and put clothing around her little boy's face. I told Frances that she was fine, that we knew where she was and we were going to get her. I stayed on the phone to her, trying to reassure her. She said her son was called Jeremiah and he was two years old. She said, we are going to die. I said, no, you're not. We're coming to get you. I was on the phone saying this for about 30, 35 minutes. I was gagging to hear that the door was being kicked in. I was just waiting to hear someone say casualty as a signal that they'd been found. I could hear her little boy crying from the beginning of the call. Then I could hear him coughing too. Then after about 30 or 35 minutes, he stopped coughing and he stopped crying. Now Zainab was crying. She said, my boy is dead. I want to be with my son. I said, don't talk like that. We're coming to get you. Don't give up. I passed the phone back to Francis and said, tell her you love her and that we are waiting for her and you're waiting for her. Tell her to keep fighting. He did speak to her and then I took the phone back from him before she told him about Jeremiah. When I took the phone back, I could hear her coughing now. I could hear other sounds like banging in the background and I kept thinking that the firefighters had reached her. I think I spent another 30 to 40 minutes on the phone to her in total. I was still in the vicinity of Tom and I asked him, where are they now? Then he told me that firefighters were unable to get past the 12th floor. She was on the 14th. I knew I couldn't tell her this. I just couldn't tell her that so basically, I lied to her and continued to tell her that we were coming up for her. It got to the point where she wasn't talking much. I could hear a bit of coughing and spluttering. I could hear that she was still there, but she wasn't responding. I kept on chatting with her for Francis' sake. I had to keep up the pretense that she was okay. When she stopped responding, I could hear a little whimpering, but I kept talking to her in case she could hear my voice. For five or 10 minutes, it was silent, but I thought I couldn't cut the phone off. I was looking up at the building and watching it burn. I could hear that the conditions inside the flat were deteriorating. I could hear that things were falling off the wall. I could hear ear splitting screaming. I think that Zainab must have been unconscious. The screaming went on for about 60 seconds, then it stopped. I knew that was it. I hung up the phone. The whole, whole phone call lasted, I think, about an hour and quarter. Firefighter Egan, who was dealing with FSG, remembers that it was getting light. He saw crew manager Batcheldor come to him 
and ask about the phone call with a woman trapped in flat 113. He looked at the board and saw that her flat had already been marked P for priority. He believed that this information had been passed on, quote, ages ago. The message was in green for adults, two, and black for children, also two. Egan knew that this flat number had, had been coming up repeatedly that night. The lady on the phone was still in the flat and the crew manager, Batcheldor, says, she just wants to die. He then contacted watch manager Wolfenden, who said that he'd passed on the message about this flat to the bridgehead. One final deployment was at, at 0328 from BA Team 40. That consisted of firefighter Lundquist and crew manager Main. They reported to the bridgehead wearing EDBA. They were told by either SM Williams or SM Wolfenden that the initial briefing was for them to go to flat 113 on the 14th floor to search for a mother and child in response to an FSG call. However, the briefing then changed at the bridgehead and they were instructed to only go to the third or the fourth floor. During the time that CM Batcheldor believes he was on the phone with Zainab, nine residents from floors 15 to 21 exited the tower. After this time, no further residents exited the tower until 0413, and those were from floors 10, 11, and 2. There were no further communications between Zainab and Jeremiah and the outside world. So in my previous presentation on behalf of the Murphy family, I discussed the report of Professor Purser in relation to both Dennis and Zainab. So I don't propose to repeat it now. Save for this, due to his age, only being two, doubtless Jeremiah would have succumbed first. Zainab's father, Zanu, had hoped to attend today. He read in advance what I was going to say on behalf of his daughter and his grandson. He came, became too emotional and said he couldn't continue. He went on to say this. In his culture, the parents don't bury their children. It's hard to stay strong, but he will have to stay strong. He said that it was like history repeating itself, as his own father had to bury his daughter too, Zainab's elder sister. That is why he's unable to attend today. So in conclusion, life for Zainab had always been difficult. She had her vulnerabilities and she had her painful experiences in life. Being learning disabled was something she was managing and coping with. Her mental health was something she was managing and coping with. It's important to remember when we think about people with disabilities that it's a club that any of us can join. It's an equal opportunity enterprise and makes no distinction for class, race, sex or gender. Any of us can find ourselves after an accident or through illness ending up with a physical disability. Any of us could suffer a breakdown, depression and find ourselves with poor mental health. The fact that Jane, Zainab suffered was not unusual. It was not unique. But she was a fighter, and throughout her life, she strove to overcome adversities and to beat the terrible odds that life had dealt her. As her cousin Linda says, Zainab was looking for a job. She was trying to get her life back together. She was looking forward. She had found a job. Maybe that would help her with all her children. 
She was trying to see if it could help for a better future. As her father Zainu said, things were turning. She was turning her life around and achieving a level of happiness for her and her beloved son. Cruelly, she was only able to enjoy that for a very short period of time. The remains of Zainab Dean were recovered from her flat, from flat 113. The remains of Jeremiah were recovered from the same flat. According to the archaeological investigation, Zainab died in close proximity to, to her son Jeremiah. Both were found in the southwest corner of the flat. Zainab's greatest fear was losing Jeremiah. That single thought occupied her final hours on this earth. Jeremiah and Zainab died as they lived, inseparable. They will be together forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Munro. At that point, we'll break. We'll resume, please, at half past two this afternoon. Half past two, please.